What is a function? The basis of this course in calculus starts with the idea of understanding what a function is and its related properties. So in this section, we'll consider what is a function and then look at the different ways we can understand how functions behave. So to begin with, we talk about what a function is. A function is a mathematical rule that defines a relationship between two related sets of numbers. When we talk about a rule, we're talking about things like addition, subtraction, division, multiplication. Sometimes we square a number or we take the square root, raising things to powers or exponents. There's all sorts of things we can do mathematically. So when we refer to a rule, that's something that we tell the function to do to describe this relationship between the numbers. There are four ways that we are going to look at functions in this course. And these four ways all give us different types of information. And sometimes we'll have information presented in one of the ways and sometimes others. So it's important that we can look at all these types of ways to understand what's happening. So first we start with a formula. A formula is an algebraic function that tells us the rules that we should be imparting between these sets of numbers. So here we have x squared minus 2x minus 3. So what this tells us is that if we were to take a number, we should first square it, which means multiplying it by itself. Then from that, we would subtract two times the number that we had plugged in, and then we would subtract three. So the algebraic formula tells us the rules using mathematical symbols and notation to describe this relationship. Another way that we can look at a function is through a picture. And in math, when we look at pictures, we call them graphs. So here, when we consider a graph, we're considering the relationship between the values that come up on the horizontal axis and the values that show up on the vertical axis. So here, for any given number on the horizontal axis, we can talk about what's happening in the vertical axis as described by this relationship. So for example, we could say here that if x equals 4.5, which is roughly here, that the corresponding y value will be negative 1. So that's a relationship. This line tells us how these two sets of numbers are related. A third way that we can evaluate different functions is through data. Oftentimes in the real world, we don't get nice smooth functions and instead we have data points that we need to evaluate. And one of the nice ways we can look at various data is through a table. So a table will give us a value in terms of x and it will tell us the other value in terms of y in the second row of the table. So tables are a good way for us to get information about these relationships for these specific numbers. Finally, we can look at functional relationships through descriptions. Sometimes we have some words that describe what the relationship is. If we're lucky, that description will allow us to come up with a formula like we saw in number one, but sometimes it's just a general idea of how two things are related. So here, the cost of ice cream, C, in dollars at a local shop in Mathtown, Ohio, is a function of the number of toppings T ordered to be put on the ice cream. So cost is a function of the number of toppings you decide to put onto your ice cream. So we know that there's a relationship. And if we think carefully about it, it's likely that the more toppings you choose, the more expensive your ice cream becomes. But we can't know for sure because there's not enough information. So one of the things we really need to think about here is what we're using as placeholders for our different inputs and outputs that we're interested in. So we want to make sure we understand the variables. The input is the number that is selected by us to plug into a function, evaluate on a graph, determine from a table, or describe as varying in a word problem. So if we decide that we want to plug in a 2, that's our input number. Sometimes we get to decide the numbers we plug in, and sometimes the problem asks us to plug in certain numbers. But the number that we plug in is called the input. The place where we plug it in is called the independent variable. The independent variable acts as a placeholder for all possible inputs. Oftentimes in mathematics, we use the letters x or t as the placeholder for the independent variable. But really, any letter can be used as described by the creator of the function. If we're writing a problem about 
say quantity, we might use the letter Q as our placeholder. Or if we're talking about dogs, we might use D. It doesn't matter the letter we choose as long as we're clear about where it is in our problem. The independent variable tends to show up on the right hand side, but we'll look at some cases later where it shows up on the other side and how we can look at if a variable is dependent or independent. One of the key things here though is that the inputs get plugged into the independent variable, which means that the rules that we're using to describe our function are imposed on our independent variable. Similarly, we also have an output. So the output is the number that's determined from the input number when plugged into a function, evaluated on a graph, determined from a table, or described as depending in a word problem. So what that means is that once we've plugged our input number in, we put all the rules onto that number and the resulting number is the output. On a graph, we would look at where that value was for the input and find the corresponding output. Similarly, on a table, the placeholder that we use for the output variable is called the dependent variable because it depends on what you input. So the dependent variable acts as a placeholder for all possible outputs. Oftentimes in math, we use the letter y or we use f of x as a placeholder for the dependent variable. But again, since it's a placeholder, any letter can be used as described by the creator of the function. And sometimes we use things like p to represent the dependent population, or we could use c as we saw above as cost. So again, it doesn't have to be y or f of x, but that's a convention that comes up quite often in mathematics. So let's see how these inputs and outputs work in terms of our dependent and independent variable for each of the four ways we had described above. So now we're gonna try example one. So for each of the following functions, we wanna determine the value of f of two and discuss the independent and dependent values that are related to f of two. So f of two means that two is going to be our input, which means that we are gonna plug that in for our independent variable. So here, if we write this as f of two, because look here, x is gonna be our independent variable here, that means that the rules are gonna be that we square it, that we multiply by two, and then we're subtracting things from each other. So here, when we do these mathematical operations, we're gonna get four, so two squared is four, minus four, minus three. So when we add those all together, we get four minus four is zero, minus three is negative three. So negative three, is my output. So my input was two, my output was negative three. My independent variable here was x, and my dependent variable here is either y or f of x, because the way this function is defined, they are related. So that's how we look at that with a formula. So now, let's try this with a table. Again, we're still looking for f of two. So f of two means that our independent value is two. On a table, when we look for an independent value, we are gonna be looking in the top row because that is where our independent variable lives. So these x values are independent values that we had plugged in. And we know that we wanted to know what happened when we plugged in two. So here, we find two on our table and we look for the corresponding y value or f of x value. Here it's f of x. And again, this row and our f of x are our dependent variable values or our outputs. So here, f of two equals seven. So again, our input was two and our output would be seven. Looking at our next form, we can consider a graph. So if we're interested in f of two, that means we have to go to where the independent variable equals two. 
When you have a graph, the independent variable shows up on the horizontal axis. So that's the one that goes from left to right. And your dependent value is in the vertical axis, so going up and down. So if we're interested in what's happening at 2, we go up to the graph at 2, and we look at the corresponding y value. <clears throat> Sometimes, if our graph isn't perfectly lined up, we have to come up with a good estimate. So here, even though this is pretty close to 1, it's not exactly 1. So I'm going to approximate. And when we approximate, we use wiggly equal signs. And I'm going to say that's approximately 0.9. So my input was 2, and my output is approximately 0.9. Finally, if we consider what's happening in a word problem or a description, we might need some extra information. So here, for this particular word problem, we want to determine what the statement f of 2 equals 525 means and discuss the independent and dependent values. So again, we're talking about the cost of ice cream, C, in dollars at the local shop in Mathtown, Ohio, which is a function of the number of toppings, T, ordered to be put on the ice cream. So F of 2 means that we're plugging a 2 in for T. That means that the number that stands alone is related to the cost. So in this scenario, the 2 is the number of toppings, and the cost is 525. So this tells me that if I choose two toppings for my ice cream, that the total cost will be $5.25. So the output here was 525, and the input was 2. So these are some examples of how input and output work for the different types of functions we're going to be looking at in this course. Now, we also have to consider whether or not our functions exist at every possible time. Now, it's sort of a strange thing to think about. So what we want to do is we want to discuss the difference between functions that exist for every value and functions that only exist for some values, like we saw in the table. We have special words for that, and this is called discrete versus continuous functions. So a discrete function is defined only for a set of input numbers that can be listed and nothing in between. The inputs have distinct and separate unconnected values, which means we may know the input should be 0, 2, and 4, and we may know the corresponding outputs, but we can't connect what's happening between 0 and 2 if we don't have that distinct information. Whereas a continuous function allows the inputs to be any value in a finite or infinite interval, including fractions, decimals, and irrational values. So if we have a continuous function, we can plug in every possible value between 0 and 2 if our interval is 0 to 2. So we could plug in 0, 1, 2. We could plug in things like 0 0.1, 0 0.111, 0 0.11111, 0 .11111, so on and so forth. So every single possible value is included in a continuous function. So let's continue and look at our examples of the types of functions we've been looking at before and try to determine if our formula first is going to be continuous or discrete on the given interval. <clears throat> so notice here that our formula y equals x squared minus 2x minus 3 doesn't have a defined interval. That means we are assuming that we are looking at the entire possible interval from negative infinity to infinity. If you are not given a restricted interval, you can assume all values unless otherwise stated. So here, this function is going to be continuous because we can plug in any value for x, which is our independent variable. We could plug in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, on and on and on. We could plug in positive numbers, negative numbers, zero, decimals, with no problems whatsoever. There's nothing about this function that is telling us otherwise. So this type of function, which is called a polynomial, is continuous. Consider now the graph below. So this graph, again, has a distinct y value 
for every possible value of x that we see on this graph. Now this graph looks like it's only defined from negative 6.5 to positive 6.5 because that is what shows up on the graph and there are no arrows at the ends of the functions. So here, there is an imposed interval that we can visually see based on the picture, but this function is still continuous on that interval because for every x value, there is a corresponding y value, no matter how small that x value is. So for 1.1111111, we could find a y value. We'd have to be really careful, but we could do it. So this function on this graph is continuous. Now let's take a look at our table. So remember that our tables are really helpful because they usually contain data, okay? And when we have data, we have points. So here we have the point zero three. So that means that when x is zero, we know that the dependent value is gonna be three. At two, it's seven. At four, it's 19. At six, it's 39. However, we don't know what's happening at one or if a value exists. We don't know what's happening at 0 0.5. We don't know what's happening between 0 and 2, 2 and 4, 4 and 6. Therefore, since we only have defined information at specific points, this function is discrete. Finally, we can look at our word problem. So here, the cost of ice cream, C in dollars, at the local shop in Mattown, Ohio, is a function of the number of toppings T ordered to be put on the ice cream. So C equals F of T. We need to figure out if our function is defined for all values of T or just specific values of T. So here, think about what T represents. T is the number of toppings. So if you choose M&Ms and Oreos, then the number of toppings is two. It doesn't make sense to have 1.5 toppings or 1.111 toppings because as soon as you choose a second topping, t becomes two, which means that the values that t can take on have to be integers. Things like zero, one, two, three, four, five. Since it doesn't make sense to have values in between, again, this function is discrete. Now, most of the things that we look at in this class are continuous. However, when we have word problems and tables, there are cases where we will look at discrete functions, especially in tables, which are inherently discrete. So while we will continue to go forward in this course knowing that we'll mostly look at continuous functions, we have to remember that there are special properties and ways that we have to consider when we have discrete functions. And some of those things will come up later today.